Hi everyone. I'm going to do another video about the wheel and instead of being focused on my solution, I want to focus a little bit more about the history of the wheel. Just about everything that I'm about to tell you, you can discover when you're on site at the wheel or you know through the pamphlets that they have and the kiosks and so on and so forth. I'm not going to get into my solve other than just to give you a perspective of where the chest was. Just a brief overview. I'll link to my saw video if you want to find more details. But primarily in there, I describe the, the map that's on site and how we use the cairns in order to guide us to where the treasure chest was. Um, the wheel itself is all based about the solstice and the stars that the wheel itself represents. And that's pretty much what I'm going to describe. But prior to doing that, I just want to give an overview of where we are. So this is a top-down shot of the wheel. To get more information, you can see my, my saw video. This is a topographical image that shows a, a better, a big overview of everything. And these are those same red lines coming off the wheel. Uh, this one is the sun coming down from the solstice. And this one, of course, points to where warm water salt. That's coming off the Famahat star or the decairn. And you can see the sun goes down. And right where it intersects the, the Five Springs Creek, which begins up here where warm water salt, and then it goes down into Five Springs Canyon, over the waterfalls, and then down into the campground, which is here. This is the road to the campground. So if you hike to campsite number nine, it's right over here where the sun intersects the creek. All right? So that'll give you an idea of where we're coming from. So I wanted to show a couple of images that are related somewhat to the history of the wheel. But before I do that, I also want to show some a uh, couple of images that I wanted to highlight due to questions that people had about my sob. So here they are now. This image here is on the way up to the wheel. And this is from the 1920s and 1930s. This used to be a spot where they would fill up old cars that would overheat that were going up the mountain. It's pretty interesting. Like I said, this dirt road used to be the only way to get to the wheel up until uh, the late 1960s. So if Forrest Fenn ever went here with his family, they would have probably stopped here to get water for the car on the way up the mountain. Pretty interesting. And there's a, uh, there's a pool out over here, and there is a, a kiosk, that explains everything that I'm telling you. It's, it's interesting. It's not really related to my saw, but it is related to the road and the wheel. Now, I wanted to show this image again. This is closer to the trail that leads up to the uh, waterfalls. So we would be looking um, downstream here. And um, all these rocks that are in this shallow creek, uh, Five Springs Creek here, all come down the side of the mountain that's on the left here from that rock slide that you see. And then the water goes down, and it goes down towards where the, the solution was. Of course, you've seen this image. This is from my sob. Here's the fire pit, the picnic table. Here's the double omega tree. Down here, about probably about 60 feet um, as the crow flies across, when you go down this hill on the opposite side here and cross the creek, that's where the nook was. So you would see it from looking down from this tree onto the opposite side. That's where you would see the nook. And this is the trail that leads to the waterfalls. This is uh, campsite number nine is here. This is the closest campsite to the waterfall. This is right where the sun comes over and crosses the creek. As you can see, here's that hole in the top of the canopy of trees. This shot is from a drone. You're not gonna see this from Google Earth, but the tree over here, the broken blaze, is an omega tree, like I said, it grew a few feet up, maybe two or three feet, and then it curves over at 90 degrees, and it forms an omega right over where the treasure was. So the sun comes down from the canyon and lights up this area right here. Now, if you were to go down that embankment, where I'm telling you from the omega tree, you go down that embank embankment, and then you walk a little bit, and then here's the creek, okay, the creek is coming from this side and going in that direction. And the nook, this is the omega tree. It comes up out of the ground, and one of the arms is busted off, I guess, by a lightning storm. I don't know. It looks like it was naturally broke. It wasn't cut with a saw. But, but when you're standing up at the campsite and you look down here, 
the tree is an omega. And you wouldn't know that until you walk right up to the omega tree that's next to the, um, the campsite and then look down. You can't see this from a distance, okay? The only other way to see it, of course, is if you were to fly a drone right above the canopy of trees in the forest there. So that's what it looks like. And like I say in my saw video, all this uh, rosier dogwood covers that nook, except for a very small area about this high. So if you're walking along the creek, you wouldn't see it. You have to actually go up next to that. And if you were to look down below that tree, that's where the hole is. And I'm going to show you the hole now. This is before um, he cleared out the debris that was tossed in there. Um, this is what you would see if you look down from that, that, not from this, but from the tree that's above it, okay? And you can see somebody, there's a bunch of debris that was tossed in there, but you can kind of see the hollowed out area, okay, underneath that. This is what that, that, uh, a lot of that debris removed, except there's still some debris that, again, was tossed in there. But you can see it better here. There's like kind of a, a rectangular shape. So the chest, the top of the chest would have been below the base of these rocks. So in other words, you, you can't see the treasure chest unless you were to walk right up to this nook where the omega is lying down and look straight down from it. That's the only way you would see that. So this is where we believe the treasure chest was. Okay. It was taken out. And somebody tossed these rocks in there. I believe that there was probably an omega or some other mark on one of these rocks. Okay. But we don't know because the site was disturbed by whoever went and retrieved or found the treasure chest. Now that I got this out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and discuss some of the fun history about the wheel, as I promised you. And keep in mind, almost all of the stuff that I'm about to show you is available either through pamphlets. Or on, or on site. Of course, you can also just go online because this is a historical area. So everything that I'm about to show you is well documented. You don't need to do any research. You don't need to read any of Forrest Fenn's books. You don't need to know any of that stuff. All you had to do was solve the poem, go to the wheel, and then everything that you needed was there to, to build this final solution. Okay, before I jump into... Uh, the wheel stuff. I wanted to show you just one quick video clip. This is a video clip that pans from left to right across where the nook is. And this is taken from standing right down alongside the creek. The creek over here is coming from up at the, the main waterfall site. Okay. And it's coming down these rocks, kind of like a mini waterfall. And then it opens up to where the nook is. You'll see she's going to pan to the right here. That's the nook. The nook is straight over here. Um, you can see it better when you're standing up at top as opposed to being right down on the side of the creek. But here's the where, the where the nook is. It's right down in here. And we're standing with our back against the omega tree. So you would walk down uh, from the campsite. Like I said, it's about 60 feet as the crow flies over here. And then you would ford the creek. And then a couple feet on the other side, right beneath this omega tree, broken omega tree, is where the treasure chest was. Let me go on now about the history of the wheel. Okay, there's a couple of pictures I want to show that you will not find on site, but these are just references that I wanted to, to show you because there's a lot of similarities to the way things work. This is a kiva from the Pueblo at San Lazaro that Forrest Fenn discovered, and he retrieved some artifacts from. This kiva, I'm not going to discuss it here, but there's a lot of correlation between this kiva and the medicine wheel, okay? They were both in that they were sacred sites, all right? So there's a lot of similarities to that, besides it just being a circle with a post that would be holding up the roof, okay? I just want you to keep that in mind. Now, this picture here, I've talked about it quite a few times on Street's channel, and I wanted to bring it up here again. This shelf, okay, is inside the Joseph Henry Sharp cabin that Forrest Fenn purchased and had moved from the area along the Bighorn and Little Bighorn confluence 
over to the Buffalo Bill Museum of Cody. I believe he moved the cabin there back in 1986 after he purchased um, Joseph Henry Sharp's estate. Well, on top of that shelf, there's a crow, a casting of a crow. This was incidentally made, I believe, in Cincinnati. Okay. The company was Rockwood and it's ceramic. Okay. This is a crow. And it's either going to be here or when you walk in the cabin, it's above the door. Joseph Henry Sharp liked this item because it reminded him of the two things that he liked the most. One, back east, okay, Cincinnati and Philadelphia areas. Two, it reminded him of the Crow Indians that he painted. That's all he painted, okay? He spent his winters up on the Crow Reservation, and he was hired, basically, to paint portraits of all the Crow Indians there. And he did that. And then in the summertime, he would spend his time at his other home, which at the time was down in Taos, New Mexico. So he went from Taos, New Mexico, up to Montana on the Indian Reservation and back. So that's what it reminded him of. Now this, you'll notice how similar that bird is that's up there, up in the moon. And you'll notice the axe man. All of this is at the end of the thrill of the chase. If you count the stumps, you'll notice that there's 23 of them. Okay? And in that chapter, Horace friend talks about his father, and he talks about row four, block 23, which is where his father is born. Well, at the medicine wheel, the parking lot, look at the, uh, the survey for that area. It's row four, block 23. That's where you park to go to the wheel. You have to park there because you have to walk to the wheel. Row four, block 23. Now, the whole fight, as you're about to learn, between the Indians, the Native Plains Indians, and the wheel was over lumberjacks. And they were trying to harvest the trees from the area. And basically, the Crow Indians, the Shoshone, the Arapaho, all 81 Indian tribes formed a coalition. Okay? And that coalition fought against the, lumber, the timber industry in Wyoming. I'll mention the exact name a little bit later when I discuss it. But they fought that company from, not, from all throughout, from 1988, I believe, all the way up through the 90s when they finally settled it. And then they had another expansion in, I believe, 2004. And then again in 2011. So they beat the lumberjacks. You're not allowed to take wood or harvest any plants in that area. And I believe that that was a hint at the thrill of the chase. I believe that's a crow up there. That's the moon. And this is representing them taking on the lumberjacks, okay, the crow and, and the stars, okay. These stars represent the wheel. The wheel is meant to observe the stars. Everything is related to the stars and the Native Plains Indians in this solve. And it makes sense because Horace Fan spent a lifetime doing what? Well, he collected Indian artifacts. It all began as a nine-year-old boy finding his first arrowhead. So it kind of makes sense, as you're about to see, that he would want to die near the wheel. Okay? And if he wants to give us an experience building a Plains Indian collection like he did, as he says in Goldenmore of The Thrill of the Chase, it would make sense that the poem's going to end somewhere near a really famous Indian site. And that's what the wheel is, as you're about to find out right now. But I wanted to get these two pictures out of the way first, because I believe that these are hints. But okay, so here's the Bighorn Medicine Wheel on top of Medicine Mountain. The mountain is sacred to all 81 Plains Indian tribes. The Native Americans view the Medicine Wheel as one of the most major sacred sites in North America and have been viewing it as a dimensional window or doorway into the spiritual world and afterlife where they go when they die or to communicate with the spirits. The medicine wheel on the mountain is a symbol of all creation, of all races, and of all people, birds, fish, animals, trees, and stones. According to tribal beliefs, the circular shape of the wheel represents the earth, the sun, the moon, and the cycles of life, the seasons, and day and night. 
moving around the perimeter of the wheel is always in a clockwise direction to keep with the rotation path of the Earth. Native American ethnographic accounts refer to the medicine wheel as the sacred altar for the medicine mountain complex, illustrating the important central role that the wheel plays in ceremonial and spiritual functions. Some use the medicine wheel as a vision quest site. Uh, others use it as a representation of the Sundance Lodge, a turtle effigy, or a place to mark the summer solstice. Here's what they say about vision quests on one of the kiosks. When we want wisdom, we go up to the mountain and we talk to our creator. Four days and four nights without food and water. Yes, you can talk to the creator up on the mountain by yourself. You can say anything you want. You're alone. There is nobody there to listen to you. It is between you and the creator spirits. Nobody else. It is a great feeling to talk to the creator. I know I have done it way up on the mountain. The wind is blowing. It is dark. It is cold. I stood there and I talked to the creator. That was written by a Lakota Sioux uh, Indian. As early as 1807, white fur traders learned that a bighorn wheel from the Crow and Shoshone Indians. Although the wheel was built high above the Bighorn Basin, and the climb up from the basin takes a lot of effort, a wide and deep-cut ancient Travis Trail takes the traveler directly to the wheel. In 1887, the Tukudita, well, I probably butchered that name, T-U-K-U-D-E-K-A, Tukudika, also known as the Sheep Eaters, there's an elder medicine woman named Greta. I got a picture of her here. She said that her people chose to live high in the Bighorn Mountains to escape human conflict and other perils. Now, this woman, incidentally, she died at, at 115 years old. She was the last, one of the last sheep eaters. And I don't know if you guys know about the sheep eater story or not, but apparently many of them died after they were put into a camp in Yellowstone. And apparently some of the blankets we gave them had uh, smallpox. And that's what ended up killing off the sheep eaters, probably including this woman. But um, anyway, a lot of people talked to her back in 1887. And this is where you, what you would see when you came to the wheel and entered the circle, the uh, perimeter around the wheel. This is what I mean about walking clockwise. They even have a sign here. It says walk left. So after you come in, you're supposed to walk this way, um, as, I, as I indicated just before. Just prior to reaching that area where the sign is, the sign is over here, you, this is what you would see. And actually, this is an older version of uh, the uh, kiosk that was there. And here's a stone carving with the wheel engraved into it. So in addition to speaking with uh, Greta, we also have um, information that was indicated from General Sheridan's expedition journals, which are dated September 20th, 1881. His expedition to the Bighorn Mountains mentions the wheel. And incidentally, as a side note, those of you that see my El Jefe video, El Jefe called himself El Jefe 1881. El Jefe is Spanish for the big guy, the boss, the chief. Okay. And his reference there when he was talking to Sam was clearly in reference to General Sheridan. Because General Sher Sheridan was the, uh, basically one of the first people that was not um, a fur trapper that discussed the wheel, but he didn't get into specifics. It's part of his journals. The second uh, document reference to the wheel occurred in 1895 when Paul, I hope this guy get this name right, Paul Frankie described his hunting exploits in the article published in Forest and Stream, which is a hunting and fishing magazine that came out in 1873. So basically, Forest and Stream, the hunting and fishing mag, is the first place that people in general found out about the wheel itself. And I'll get more into the dates uh, soon. First, I want to discuss some of the uh, specific statistics about the wheel. It's at an elevation of 9,642 feet. Now, that's slightly lower than the peak of Medicine Mountain, which is just to the south of it. I believe that's just slightly over 10,000 feet. Um, the wheel is approximately 80 feet in diameter. It's got 28 rock spokes radiating from the perimeter of the central cairn. 
And I want to say something about those spokes because the, the number 22 is pretty popular in, uh, for his friend in the chase. There's 22 gems on his bracelet. There's a lot of references to 22. He's alone in the book in uh, Thrill of Chase on page 22. But anyway, if you come in this area, okay, you come in this way, and like I said, it says walk left here. So if you begin counting the spokes from where you walk in, the spoke for the sunrise is the 22nd spoke. So that's where we would um, we would put our back to the sun, and it leads you right down to where the treasure chest was. So there are five smaller stone enclosures connected to the outer circumference of the wheel, and the sixth and westernmost enclosure is located out of the circle of the wheel, but is clearly linked to the central car and by one of the spokes. That's what they're talking about here. When you come in, you got A, B, C, D, E, and then the only one that's on the inside of the wheel is F. And that's where the brave would come in and sit. And he would sit here and he would gaze at the stars that are referenced to over the, the currents themselves. Okay. If he wanted to view the sunrise, he would stand here at E, and he would look across the center of the wheel on summer solstice, and he would see the sun rising. So the sunbeam comes down across the earth, right across the earth, right down, of course, to where the chest is. If you stood here at the sea cairn and looked across the center, you would see the solstice sunset. Okay? So when, when you're talking about the stars, we got Aldebaran, which is part of Taurus, okay? And then we got Rigel, which is part of the Orion. And then we got the dog star here, Sirius, which is the sea cairn. Now, the dog star is not actually the sea cairn. It's a little bit over this way. You would look like along that, that uh, spoke right there. And that, that's where you would see Sirius. And then, of course, we didn't want to see Falmahat, which is where warm waters halt. That would be this current. So you'd be sitting here looking across this way. And that current represents what they call the celestial sea. And I'll get to that in a moment. That side of the sky is all about the sea. Everything is themed around the sea. And, of course, I already described he is over here. So back in the 1830s, they had a stone wall around the wheel. And in 1991, where the, when the chain fence was there, there was only one small wooden, in, wooden interpreted sign there that said medicine wheel. Now, when I read that, of course, I'm thinking about Forrest Fenn's father, where they pound the sign on the ground and said principal. Okay? That's all they had at the wheel. There was nothing there to teach anybody about it. There were no, in, no kiosks, no, nothing, no interpretive signs, no information. They just had the wheel and one sign that said medicine wheel on it. Okay? These days, of course, it's surrounded by a rope, and uh, there are many interpretive signs. So this is the rope. This is this day. Before, they had the rope, like I said, chain link fence. And then before that, they had a wall around it. And then before that, of course, there, there was nothing around it. Okay. By 1990, they estimated having 30,000 visitors to the wheel. And it apparently goes up about 20% every year. And here's an interesting side note that I got. For those of you that have been to the Denver Museum, Right outside the museum, I guess near the parking lot, there's a, a medicine wheel. And that medicine wheel at the Denver Museum was inspired by the Bighorn Wheel. The artist that made it was an Arapaho Indian. And he placed the Cheyenne words, Na Kev O Ia Sim, on the wheel that's in Denver. And if you, if you uh, translate that to English, it means we are always returning back home again. So, again, they consider this wheel their spiritual home. Now, there are a lot of significant dates in the wheel. Let me start highlighting the important ones. In 1903, Stephen C. Sims of the Chicago Field Museum, upon examining the wheel, surmised that the Travis Trail must have been well-traveled for long periods in the past to acquire its deeply cut edges. Like I said, there was no road here, nothing but a Travis Trail. A Travis Trail, incidentally, is when they take a mule and then they have two pieces of wood or logs that extend from the wheel's body to the back of the wheel, and then they use it to drag their equipment up. That's a Travis trail. So the poles make ruts in the ground, similar to what a, um, a wagon, a coach, wagon coach, you know, what horses would do. They make the ruts 
where the wheels are. Well, initially, those ruts came from uh, donkeys and horses dragging the created Travis trails. And then after that, of course, in this case, you would have Model Ts and other uh, old cars that would cut it deeper and, you know, and then eventually, of course, they become roads or other trails. That's how things evolve, uh, unfortunately. So you can't really see the uh, trail as it was in its old state thousands of years ago, all right? Come 1970, it was finally designated as a national historic landmark, okay? Then, in 1974, an astronomer and solar scientist named John Eady visited and studied the wheel. He's the one that discovered all the connections from the wheel to the stars. The only one he did not discover was the D cairn, okay? He didn't discover the D cairn. In 1979, a Florida amateur astronomer named Jack H. Robinson made calculations that show that the southerly bright star Pomat, which is also known as the mouth of the constellation of Pis Pisces Australis, and by the way, that's south lying. It's not the zodiac Pisces symbol for astrology. It's a different one. It's called Pisces Astralanius or something like that. Boy, I'm butchering these words. So it rose helically and could be sighted from the F car just like the other stars. So the star is sighted at both wheels when you're looking from F to O, like I said before. That's where you'll find Fomahat. So Fomahat link wasn't discovered until 1979, five years after Edie discovered the other Carns and the ties to the uh, solstice sunset. In 1988, the officials from the U.S. Forest Service proposed changes that were designed to accommodate and encourage tourism at the landmark wheel. Initially, the Forest Service proposed building a large parking lot, a viewing tower, a modest visitor center, all within about 100 meters of the wheel. Of course, this outraged all of the Plains Indians, and they began to fight back. Okay, And this is interesting because this all occurred the same time Forrest Friend got cancer, 1989. So in 1990, the Medicine Wheel Coalition for Sacred Sites of North America was created with the assistance of the AAIA, which is the Association on American Indian Affairs. At this time, the protected area around the wheel was only roughly 110 acres. In 1992, another man named J. Ellis Ransom, he is an author, a poet, and an anthropologist. He published a book on his studies that linked the medicine wheel back to Aztec times. The book is titled Bighorn Medicine Wheel, The Birth and Death of Humanity, and its successor, the Aztec Calendar Stone. All of his medicine wheel research and work is at the Cody Museum and the Kraken Research Library as part of MS 011 Carol Hunter collection. Okay, 1934. So apparently, like I said, Jay, I, you know what's interesting about J. Ellis Ransom? He was born in 1914. Okay. And I, nobody knows when he died. It, it's really odd. I believe somewhere I seen that he died in 2007, in which case he would have been 93 in 2007. I don't know if he died then or earlier. I know it was it was sometime after the nineties because he wrote a book he wrote books in the nineties. So that's pretty interesting um that he came up with that. And his theories, I read the book, I bought it. His theories are totally different than um what uh, Dr. Edie found. See, he believes that it goes way back before the current Plains Indians. He believes that it goes back to Clovis culture, okay, twelve thousand years ago when North America was first settled by uh, humans that they crossed over near the Bering, Bering Strait, came down through current day um, Alaska and Canada, and then right through Montana, and right through the Bighorn Basin. At that time, Yellowstone itself, 12,000 years ago, was still under roughly a half a mile of ice. So there was no traveling up there. They, they traveled through the Bighorn Basin. So in 1996, an agreement known as the HPP was reached with the Forest Service and the state and local government agencies designed to ensure that the entire area around the Medicine Wheel and Medicine, and Medicine Mountain is managed in a manner that protects the integrity of the site as a sacred site. 
The document established is an area of consultation that encompassed all archaeological sites and digs and Native American tradition use of the areas associated around here within the Bighorn Mountains. In 1999, Wyoming Sawmills Incorporated, a local logging company, filed a lawsuit seeking to overturn the HBP. They claimed it violated the First Amendment of the Constitution and several other federal laws. The Coalition for the Wheel and the Forest Service ultimately prevailed with the Tenth Circuit Court Appeals, which incidentally happened in Denver. The Tenth Circuit Courts of Appeals ruling in 2004 dismissing the lawsuit and a petition to the Supreme Court for review. All of it was ultimately denied. Okay. And then in 2011, the protected area was extended once again to 4,080 acres. It is also renamed from the Bighorn Medicine Wheel to the Medicine Wheel slash Medicine Mountain National Historic Landmark. So that happened in 2011. So right now it's roughly 4,000 acres around the wheel. So pretty much when you're coming down along the sun, the wheel is protected right until approximately where the Five Springs Falls are. That's the end. That's the end of the national forest. Outside of that bounds of where the falls are, it, it goes from national from the Bighorn National Forest to BLM land. Okay, when it reaches the uh, Five Springs Campground, I want to make a couple of more points here. Now, this wheel is basically primarily when Eddie, when Doctor Edie came there, said that it was all tied to the summer solstice. Okay, it tracked. Prim primary things to allow the natives to keep track of when the solstice began and when the solstice would end. So I want to explain something about solstice. The word solstice is derived from the Latin word sol, which means sun, and sistier, which means to stand still. Because at the solstices, the sun's declination appears to halt or stand still. Okay? So here's some times and dates for you. This is from the year 2021, okay? The sunrise at the Ecairn would have been at 526 a.m., and the sun would appear at 55 degrees north azimuth. The sunset was at 9.01 p.m., 620-2021. That's the day of the summer, of the longest day of the year, the summer solstice sunrise and sunset, okay? And that was, again, June 20th, 2021. Every year, of course, it changes. I think it could be any, anywhere from the 20th to the 21st, or that might be the 19th to the 21st. So it changes over time. But in, in 2020 and 2021, I believe there was only one minute difference in the time that it would sunrise. Okay? Vamahat rises 28 days before the solstice. So when they were sitting here, okay, 28 days before the solstice, they would observe, if they looked in this direction, Fomahat would rise, which means that it, just before the sun would come up, Fomahat would appear right on the horizon for a brief second, like it would blink for, for a, 10 seconds or however long it takes the sun to rise and overpower. The atmosphere would overpower it, and you can no longer see it. That's what they mean whenever they say rises. So Fomahat would rise, and when that happened, that means that it was springtime and it was going to be 28 days before the summer solstice. Okay. Now, Aldebaran, which is the acorn. So you're sitting here looking towards the acorn. That would rise two days before the solstice. So again, this one's 28 days before the solstice. This one would be two days before the solstice. And then, of course, two days after that. You could stand here and observe the sunrise I just talked about. And then you could stand here and observe the sunset of the solstice day. Okay. Now, Rigel B rises almost exactly one lunar month, 28 days after Aldebaran rises. So now we're 28 days into summer. And then, of course, Sirius, that rises 28 days after Rigel. So when Sirius rises, it would be, on well, in 2021, it was August 13. And that means that roughly a month from now, it's going to be fall, 
and it's time for the Indians to head, head down from the mountains and start preparing for winter. Okay. That's pretty much how, it would, how that would work. Um, now, I want to talk about the Cairns in a little bit more detail and just give you a little bit of uh, mythology. I'm not going to dive into it too deep because they don't dive into it too deep at the site. But I just want to explain a little bit. Now, Aldebaran, again, Aldebaran is this one. Aldebaran is also known as the red eye, the eye of Taurus the bull. It translates to the follower. Okay. And Taurus the bull, of course, symbolizes strength, powerful, and domination. Now, Rigel, of course, the bee cairn, that star is known as the blue wolf. It is the foot or toe of Orion Hunter, and it translates to the left leg or the left toe or foot of a giant. Now, Orion, of course, the constellation is Orion the Hunter. Now, if you read anything about Orion, he's, of course, up in the sky. He was put there to forever battle towards the bull. Okay? Now, Orion is known, like I said, the hunter or the giant hunter. And he's an archer. He's wearing a belt and he's wielding a bow and he's hunting Taurus. Rigel, incidentally, is also used in this for southern navigation, just like we use Polaris in the north. Now, right next to the sea cairn, when you're looking down this spoke here, okay, that's where you would have Sirius. A Sirius is known as the white wolf or the dog star. And it, what that translates to is glowing, lit, or scorching. Now, that, of course, is part of Canis Major, the greater dog. And that's one of Orion's hunting dog. That's that constellation. Now, of course, again, we got Fomat here, the decarn. Okay. That is known as the lonely one, the solitary one. Now, the reason for that is because it's right on the border, the edge of the Milky Way. And it's kind of in a dark area. Until you reach the Milky Way, there's not that many stars there. So they say it's the loneliest star because it's kind of by itself. But it kind of signifies the beginning of the celestial sea. So Fomahat translates to the mouth of the fish. It also can be translated to the first frog. Okay. Now that's part of what they call, like I said, Pisces Astrinus, the southern fish. And the mythology behind it is it's drinking water where Aquarius, which is the water bearer, is spilling into his urn. So again, right above this, right above here, when you look out in the horizon, okay, right above in the sky, that star is the mouth of a fish sitting at the end of a stream that goes from the jug of water that Aquarius is spilling from his urn and it's going into the fish's mouth. And incidentally, the, the mythology is that the fish saved all of mankind by drinking the water instead of flooding the earth. Now, of course, the sun itself, the sun is a star, right? Obviously, it's our main star. And we have the sunrise, and then we have the sunset. So E is the sunrise, C is the sunset. Now, the sunrise is, usually signals a ceremonial sun dance. It's a symbolic of death and renewal. The dancer was believed to be reborn mentally, spiritually, and physically after a ceremonial sun dance. Okay, so now we get to where we parked in a parking lot. Remember, row four, block 23. We parked our car. We walked up to the wheel. On the way to the wheel, we're going to pass what's called the Crossroads of Culture Overlook. Now, this area that we're standing at here, where this bench is, the bench and the kiosk are at a place known as the Overlook. Five Springs Saddle, because that's the definition of geography. This is actually sitting in a saddle, okay? So technically, these three guys are saddled up and on a horse. This is known as the saddle. And again, this is documented on site. Now, of course, we already know the names of the people. We have Charles Brady, okay? He's an Arapaho elder. We have Francis Brown. Francis Brown is also an Arapaho elder. And also, he's the president of the Medicine Wheel Coalition for Sacred Sites of North America. All three of these guys belong to that coalition. But Francis Brown is the, the main guy. He's the El Jefe. He's the chief. He's the president, right? And then, of course, we got 
Haman Wise, W-I-S-E. He's a Shoshone elder. And by the way, when I'm saying elders, I believe that also means that they were medicine men. Okay? E either way, they were certainly familiar with the, with the wheel. I have a video, and you can sit and listen to Francis Brown talking about the fight over this wheel. Okay? I, I got that from a PBS station, and I put it up on my channel for you guys to check out if you want to hear what he had to say about the wheel. So this is the sign you will find up there where that bench is, okay? And again, this is in the Five Springs Saddle, which sits above the Five Springs Basin. And it's and you'll walk right past it while you go to the wheel. You have to pass the spot. There's no other way to go. Um, but this overlooks the intersection of several prehistoric trails used for as long as 10,000 years ago. Those trails intersect providing main access to the medicine wheel for all ancient Americans. Over 81 different tribes still utilize the ancient Travis Trail to practice their traditional ceremonies. Okay? And incidentally, I want to point out that the Medicine Wheel Coalition for Sacred Sites of North America is based out of Taos, New Mexico. Uh, Francis Brown was born in Arapaho, Wyoming. Okay, he's Arapaho Indian. I believe the same is true of Charles Brady. Now, Francis Brown at one point lived in the Taos Pueblo down in Taos, New Mexico. Did Forrest Fenn ever know these people? I don't know. I would assume he did. I would assume he did. And obviously also Joe Medicine Man Crow. Because most of the money that, that funded the, uh, the defense of this, a lot of it came from Cody. It came from the rich people there. And one of the people that would ra help raise the money would have been Joe Medicine Man Crow. So it makes me wonder, and I believe it's true, that Forrest Fenn also invested a lot of money into this, kind of as a gesture to give back, right? Think about it. All this was happening in 1988, all this controversy, and Forrest Fenn was on his deathbed. Now, Forrest Fenn spent his whole life collecting Indian stuff. So what better way to give back to the Indians but to help them? So I believe he set it up a corporation or an S-Corp, if you will, and he did exactly that, okay? And he helped raise money in Cody also, in addition to that, to help pay for it. And they won. They beat the lumberjacks and no wood. Actually, you can't even go here to get plants. I don't believe you're allowed to take sage. The same is true um, over by um, Six Canyon. There's sage over there, too. And it's illegal to take the sage unless you're... You're an Indian, a native, and you're using it for a ceremony. This overlook is looking down to the intersection, okay, right where you would have to turn off to come up through the canyon from below in order to get to uh, the Five Springs campground. You have to take the ancient trail. That's the only way to get there, okay? Um, if, you, if you're walking, obviously, if you're driving nowadays, you just drive up the road and go there. But the natives would use that road. And it's funny because they come up that road. They'll swing around the wheel, okay? They'll come up here this way, and they'll come in the wheel and go this way. They will not enter the wheel from this side. They will come up here and, like, go over here or come up over this way and go here. They will always come to the wheel and enter and follow it around. That's just their belief. That's how it works. So it's interesting. And they would do that even if it takes them out of their way. So now we're back down at the road down here. This is the intersection where you would have to turn off to go up to get the treasure chest to go up into the canyon. Okay. So the, if we were going this way, this is this road that, that would go up in this direction where I'm moving my mouse. That road is called 14 Alter. If you go this way, it'll take you up to the wheel. If you want to go to the um, to the uh, Five Springs Falls or Five Springs Falls Campground, you would make a left off of 14, and you would take old 14A Road. And that's how you would go up to the wheel. So you could read more about that road here on this sign, okay? Uh, basically, the original northernmost road of the over the Bighorn Mountains was this road here, the old 14A, okay? Now, currently, it's 14A. But 14A didn't exist prior to 1965. This road went through many name changes. First, it was just an ancient Travis Trail used by the Indians, like I just explained. 
Okay. Then it became Salt Road. Then it became the Dayton Kane Road. Then now it's Five Springs Campground Road slash Old 14A because there's no other reason to go there other than to get to the campsite. Okay. Now, the reason why it was at one time referred to the Dayton Kane Road. It's because of it's named after the two towns that connected. It connected Kane, Wyoming to Dayton, Wyoming. Kane is on the west, Dayton's on the east. Now, the east side first contained trails that were used to haul mining equipment from Gillette, Wyoming, Fortunatus. It's a gold mine that was near Bald Mountain in the 1890s. So this road was very dangerous due to steep grades and sharp curves. So in 1912, construction began to improve the route on the Dayton side. Now, remember, that's the east side. There was no way down the, the west side of the mountain except for the Travis Trail. Now, the west side was known as a wagon track of extreme steepness and sharp turns. So around 1912, the settlers on the west side also began extending it over to meet the road that they were forming from the east. Okay? So the Big Foreign Basin improvement of the first road on the west side was only to get salt down from the mountains into the summer passage. That's why it was known as Salt Road. By the mid-1930s, the Dayton Kane Road was mostly complete thanks to private funding. In the early 1930s, the road was taken over by, over sta taken over by the state, and eventually it was asphalt paved by 1939. The road remained as the only northern route across the Bighorns until construction of the current 14A began in 1964 okay now this road ends old 14a ends right at the border of the blm campground blm land and the national forest so it contains forest it, it contains trail number 140 that takes you up into the bighorn national forest if you follow trail 140 it'll take you right up to the wheel all right you used to be able to drive on Trail 140, because it was part of Old 14A, but they shut it down and made it a bicycle-only trail. No motor vehicles are, are allowed on it. Um, I believe in this in the winter you can snowmobile up it. I'm not sure about that, but in any case, you can't bring any cars there. There's a gate there. Now they don't need a gate at the lower campsite because when you go to the the place like where the treasure chest was, when you're going to the waterfalls. There's no way out. It's a box canyon. You go in one way, and once you get to the falls, you can't go any farther. It's impossible to climb that. So there's no way out from there. Okay. That's why back in the day, the sheep eaters and other Indians, when they would go down to a lower elevation, would stay in a canyon like that because it shelters them from the wind and the water. I mean, the wind and the snow, and they're still next to water and they can guard everything because there was only one way in so if an enemy was coming they would see that so it's a perfect place to go so now of course the five springs campground let me read you a little bit about the five spring falls campground itself five springs falls campground provides an excellent opportunity for camping hiking picnicking and sightseeing the elevation ranges from 6520 feet at the campground to 7240 feet at the forest boundary where the waterfalls is this area offers breathtaking views of the northern Bighorn Basin with a panoramic view of the Bighorn, Pryor, Absaroka Mountains, and wildlife in the area include deer, elk, moose, black bear, and mountain lion. The lower loop of the campground contains nine campsites with tent pads and fire rings, picnic tables, and a central toilet facility. The sites in the lower camp are suitable for tents, camping, and picnicking only with the exception of site number one, where a parking and camp trailer is possible. There is a water faucet adjacent to those site to provide water for all visitors. A short hike on the trail from the parking area leads to a lookout at the Five Springs Falls. There are two benches located along the trail to the falls. The upper loop of the campground contains 10 more campsites. And, and incidentally, the upper loop, they're talking about the area where the the gate is that where trail 140 is i asked tents campsite with tent pads fire rings and a central toilet facility travel up the access road to the campsites which the parking 
are located along the right side of the road and surrounding the upper parking area. Some of the campsites in the upper loops are designed as pull-through sites suitable for camp trailers. There are two benches located near the left access road adjacent to the toilet that provide an overlook of the surrounding uh, Bighorn Basin. Yeah, incidentally, it's interesting because I wouldn't bring a, a trailer like over 20 feet long up there because you wouldn't be able to, to make the uh, hairpin turns as the road zigzags up there. At the lower camp where the treasure chest is, okay, right where you park your car and you get out, this is the first sign that you'll see. And this is the main trail to the Five Springs Falls viewpoint. This is the trail that I believe Forrest Friend wants you to take, okay? But the problem is you're going to exit that trail when you get a campsite number nine. You're not going to take it all the way up to the waterfall because the sun intersects it at campsite number nine. It's not up at the waterfall, okay? Um, this is the first place that it intersects it. And it's interesting because if you look at the mouth of the canyon as it opens up near campsite number nine, <laughs> if you were actually there on solstice, sunrise, the sunlight would come down through the canyon walls and would form a narrow beam that would actually shoot down right over to where the treasure chest is. Now, obviously, you don't need to be there on a specific day to get the chest or solve the poem, but by looking at a topographical map, and then you could read the, um, the uh, angle, the azimuth of the uh, sun on that solstice day, all that information is already available. You'll know because you can see it. You can see the cairns and the map on the wheel. It's got the center cairn and it's got the E cairn. All you got to do is draw a line that inter intersects both of them and goes straight down. And it'll come right over to, uh, right over, not this sign, but it comes over um, campsite number nine. And incidentally, once you go past campsite number nine, there's another sign there and it says warning. At this point, the trail is no longer maintained. Travel at your own risk if you want to go to the waterfalls. Beware of rock slides. So there's your heavy loads and water high and no place for the meek. So that's pretty much it, folks. That more interesting information about the wheel itself. And I, and I hope that you guys enjoy it. I want to mention a couple of other interesting things about this. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of. You know how Forrest Fenn talks about Alice in Wonderland? And he talks about the Wyoming Senator, Al Simpson, he said he can quote the entire book of Alice in Wonderland from memory. Um, Alice in Wonderland, of course, is a strange book. And I used to think it was for children, but it's, it's not. They actually use it for advanced, um, in college, actually, study of uh, writing. It's interesting. Um, a few of uh, Lewis's books, uh, the strange characters um, that Alice in Wonderland discovers when she is on her journey through the looking glass. Now, the interesting thing is, is um, all of the characters in Alice in Wonderland are named after stars and constellations. For example, the Mad Hatter holding his teapot that never stops flowing. Well, that's a representation of Aquarius. The water bearer pouring water into, into his jug, which, of course, is going into Fama, right? Um, the fish footmen. Those are named after Pisces. Mock Turtle, there's Taurus. The Dog, well, that's Canis Major, Sirius. Okay? March Hare, that's Lepus, which is the hare that Canis Major is chasing, if you read the mythology. The Old Man on the Fence, guess who the Old Man on the Fence is? That's Orion. So it, it's very interesting. And the, and the whole mirror theme, too, you know. Through the Looking Glass and what Alice found there. That's another book, Alice Gets to Wonderland. By passing through a mirror. Themes of reversal and inversion appear throughout the books. So there's all your connections to stars. And of course, you know, we have the, uh, the, it was found under a canopy of stars in the Lush Green Forest. There you go. I showed you both of them. There is no other place that was in Wyoming that the Plains Indian used to observe the stars. It was done at the wheel. Everything is centered around the wheel. Um, you know, it's just amazing. There's a lot more history to it, but I didn't want to go any more deeper than this because none of this is really required for the solve. Um, just the very basics, as you can see when you watch my other video. But I find all this stuff very uh, interesting, and I hope you do too. If you do, please click the like button. Please help me pass this by pa passing the video around. It doesn't cost you anything. 
And please sure to hit that subscribe button. Anyway, I hope you guys have a great week. Uh, rest of your week and weekend. Peace.